Our guest today believes the Western world's emphasis on speed erodes health, productivity, and quality of life. His message is simple and game-changing. To thrive in a fast world, you have to slow down. So let's dive into the power of slow in a fast world with Carl Honoré. You're listening to the Declutter Hub podcast, bringing you tried and tested, no-nonsense tips and advice from the leading experts in decluttering and organizing your home. Now here's your host, Ingrid Janssen. Hello and welcome listeners, I'm Ingrid. If you're new to the Declutter Hub podcast, you're so welcome. What you'll find is that we try and find the fun factor in the serious business of decluttering. And if you've been here for a while, you know exactly what we mean. So thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get involved in conversations related to this podcast, it all takes place in our free Facebook group. So come and join our lovely, warm and supportive community. Go to declutterhub.com forward slash group to find out more. Well, hello, Carl. Welcome to the Declutter Hub podcast. I'm absolutely thrilled that you are here as our guest today. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled and honored to be here. Looking forward to chatting. I've come clean already that I'm a little bit nervous because I am so in awe of everything that you do. And it's been (laughs) so long since we've seen each other. It's like, oh, I can't believe I've got Carl on the podcast. So if I sound a bit like, oh, it's because I'm just excited about recording this podcast with you. We will find a a gentle, easy way where neither (laughs) of us feels nervous. (laughs) The groove is there. Let's get in. Uh, Well, you know, thank you for taking time out of your busy diary to have this slow talk with us. (laughs) (laughs) I've always got time for a slow talk. Oh, you know, you make me laugh so much when I uh, approached you to say, would you love, uh, would you like coming on the show? And you replied back immediately with like, I would love to, et cetera. And I went back, wow, thanks for your quick reply. And you said, well, sometimes it's good to be slow, but sometimes it's good to be quick. And I thought... That is such a fantastic answer. <laughs> that kind of sums up the whole slow philosophy, if you like, right? Because exactly. I'm not I'm not an extremist of slowness. Sometimes faster is better. <laughs> exactly. Now we've met. I, I have was I've been lucky enough to hear you speak twice, uh, back in 2015 and 2016. Um, but you've also been a TED speaker twice. You've written five books. I mean, you are the voice of the slow movement and you travel all around the world. Your book has been translated in 35 languages. I think you speak four languages yourself. I mean, wow, what a resume. It's been quite a ride, actually. (laughs) When I I look back to my first book, In Praise of Slow, coming out in English in 2004, that's 19 years ago now. And I just think at the time... I just had an idea that I wanted to put out into the world. I had no idea where it would go. You know, the question at the core of that book was, is it possible to slow down in a fast world? Can we do it? Is Mm. there such a thing as a slow movement? And you fast forward two decades and the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Right? The slow movement has just grown very fast across all walks of life. It's, It's kind of thrilling and also obviously personally gratifying, but it's actually more exciting in a bigger picture because it just means that the more we move towards slowing down, the more we move away from fast forward roadrunner living, the better it is for all of us mm. and the planet. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely want to come back to that and definitely want to come back to productivity and environment as well. But let's go back, if if you allow me, let's go back to the beginning a little bit because you, I, I saw you in the, in, in the TED Talk, I, said, I think it was in 2005. Um, so you wrote your book in 2004. What made you write the book? What was your moment that you thought, I'm going to write a book about slowness? It, it was very <laughs> unusual at the time. Particularly for me, because I was and always have been a naturally fast person. And at the time, I was working as a foreign correspondent, which is a very highly accelerated profession, all about deadlines. And I was just stuck in in, in turbo mode. And I've realized now, looking back over my career, that all of my books start with the same spark. The starting point is always a personal existential crisis. And it was no different 
with the first book in Praise is Slow. And the crisis <laughs> was this, that I just back in those days found that I could not I could not slow down even in moments when I clearly should. So when I started reading bedtime stories to my son, I'd go into his bedroom at the end of the day and I would be speed reading Snow White. You know, I, I was <laughs> skipping lines paragraphs. Whole, I became an expert at what I called the multiple page turn technique, where you, I don't know, you, try, you try to sneak you know, three, four pages back, but it never works because these confounded kids know the stories back to front. So my son would always catch me out. He'd say, daddy, why are there only three dwarves in the story today? <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Grumpy? And this lamentable state of affairs went on for some time until I caught myself flirting with buying a book I'd heard about a book called The One Minute Bedtime Story. So Snow White in 60 Seconds. And I kid you not, I thought, when I heard that, I thought, what a great idea. I need that book now. Amazon drone delivery, right? <laughs> but then a second reaction swept over me. It was like a light bulb over the head moment. And I thought, whoa, has it really come to this? Am I am I really in such a hurry that I'm prepared to fob off my little boy with a soundbite instead of a story at the end of the day? And it was one of those moments of genuine and searing epiphany. It was like an out-of-body experience. I could see myself from the side in sharp relief. And what I saw there was just, it was just ugly. It was unedifying. I realized that I was racing through my life instead of living it. And that for me was the the inflection point. I thought, I need to change. <laughs> but of course, as a journalist and a writer and someone who thinks about the big picture always, I wanted to burrow down into understanding not only my own addiction to speed, but the bigger picture, why we're all hooked on fast. And, and that was the start of traveling around the world and investigating our whole tangled relationship with time. And and the, the fruit of that was my first book, In Praise of Slow, which ended up becoming the handbook of, of what people call the slow movement. And wh why do you think we're all so addicted to fast? I mean, because we all are, you know, now we can click and it gets delivered Hours later, you know, we we love fast, but we I think we all realize that it's bad for us. But why do we love it all so much? I think I think there are a number of reasons. One is that we if you can go down deep into our relationship with time itself, <laughs> you know, when man started measuring time, even you go way back a couple thousand years to sundials, simply having a sundial caused people to have a schedule and having a schedule causes people to hurry. Because as soon as you have a schedule, you have a deadline and that changes your relationship with time. So obviously we get into the modern era and then we have clocks and factories and then we have, you know, digital clocks blinking on our wrists and in our faces in the corner of our computer screens. And there's this constant pressure to speed up, to make the most of time. Think of that eternal expression that Benjamin Franklin uttered 250 years ago, time is money, right? Mm. And it trips off our tongue today in the early 21st century. It sounds so modern because it's come to define how we have think about time, not just in the workplace, but in every corner of our lives. We're mm -hmm. constantly striving to optimize, to squeeze more and more into less and less time. So think of me reading bedtime stories. I'm turning bedtime stories into an exercise in productivity. <laughs> you see the same thing with people embracing sexual techniques that trigger an orgasm in 30 seconds, right? <laughs> it's this kind of crazy obsession with reaching the finish line. And I think it's become a cult, a cult of speed, a cult of busyness, a cult of rushing that has now infected every corner of our lives. I think of it as a virus. It's like, it's the virus of hurry. But it's not just about our, our relationship with time. You touch there on technology, having these gadgets that allow us to do everything at the speed of software or at the flick of a switch or the swipe of a screen conditions us to expect everything to happen that fast, right? Yeah. So we get into this mode, we're expecting even human beings to move at the speed of an algorithm. Yeah. So you, you now with WhatsApp recently offered a new function where you can listen to people's messages on two times, three times speed. A lot of people now watch films at two times speed or listen to the, probably some people are listening to this podcast at accelerated <laughs> speeds, <right? laughs> But of course, what that does is it turns us into speed demons where we are skimming the surface. We are not really experiencing things. We're just ticking the boxes. And I think that explains a lot of the sense of dissatisfaction there is in the modern world that we're surrounded by such affluence. The world is this endless smorgasbord of things to do and experience. And we feel a pressure to, to we want to have it all, right? To use that famous expression from the women's magazines. But having it all is just a recipe for hurrying it all. And then I just want to put one more final footnote in here, which is an even deeper driver, I think, of the speed culture. And that is that for many of us, going fast, being busy, distraction, stimulation is a form of denial. It's a way of running away from ourselves. It's a way of avoiding those deeper questions like, who am I? What is my purpose here? Am I living the right life for me? 
it's much easier. There's le- there's less heavy lifting when you just grapple with the small stuff. Like, where are my keys? I'm late for my 11 a.m. Right, and and I think for a lot of people. Speed is a way of running away from ourselves. It's interesting because when you um, mentioned um, WhatsApp, I I had a little kind of side path in my brain going on of my daughter who recently sent me WhatsApp and I did not reply because I was busy doing something else. Busy, there you go. And she was like, mom, are you ghosting me? I've (laughs) seen the two ticks. I've seen the two ticks that you've read my message, but you've not responded. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, are we now actually measuring how quickly I respond to something you ask me that I'm suddenly now ghosting you? I mean, what is this all about? I've been doing other things. You just have to wait until it's your turn. You know? And it's like, yeah. they, the, I think the kids do things even quicker than we, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe I feel old. I'm not so moment. sure. I'm not so sure about that. I think, I, I actually think that's one of the myths of that swirl around this debate is that somehow digital natives are more marinated in instant gratification and speed than the rest mm. of us. Man, I look at my mom who's in her eighties and if you don't answer her, you know, WhatsApps <laughs> within the hour. She's sending a follow up to see what's wrong or asking if she's being ghosted. So I think this is something that cuts across all generations at the moment. And it's something that springs from human nature. And right, and, and so much of the way these gadgets are put together. I mean, Silicon Valley has hired the best brains in psychology and neuroscience to make these tools and toys that fill up our world addictive, right? They are genuinely Mm -hmm. built to be addictive. Everything down to the color used in the little dot showing you've got a message coming in, the ticks, the notifications, the reminders, all that stuff is there to keep you on that hamster wheel of instant response, instant gratification, instant, instant, instant. And it's hard because of that to break free. Hard is not the same as impossible though, thankfully. And many, many people are now saying, no, you know, I love WhatsApp. My iPhone's great, but there are times to put it aside. There are times to switch it off. There are times to be present in the moment, moving through the world at a human pace rather than at the rhythm of technology. So you wrote a book, like you said, just about two decades ago. You say that the slow movement has grown, but have you then actually seen life slow down or has the awareness of being more slow grown? And are we even faster than we were in 2004? What do you think? uh, (laughs) There are several questions in there. I I think the, the, the short answer is that the keynote, the hallmark of our culture is still one of acceleration. I think that we are faster by and large across the culture, but at the same time, the countercurrent for slowness has grown exponentially. Certainly the awareness of the damage and the harm that all of the speed, distraction, multitasking (laughs) stimulation is doing to every aspect of our lives, that awareness now is right up there uh, at very high levels. The next step, of course, is to go from the awareness to change. Mm. And that's where we're lagging. I, I say that the slow movement has grown very fast because it has. There are now in every pocket of human existence, you'll find a slow movement, whether it's slow food, slow education, slow management, slow leadership, slow travel, slow fashion, slow architecture, you know, people bringing the lens of slow to whatever it is they're doing and saying, how can I do this better and enjoy it more by slowing down to the right, the right pace, the right rhythm. So that that's good, but we still have a, we still have a long way to go. There's no question. Uh, But I today looking back, feel more confident and more optimistic than I did five years ago. Not least because I think the pandemic, in a funny sort of way, was a real fillip for the slow movement. It gave it a boost. It it supercharged it because what was the pandemic, if not a global workshop in slowness, right? It actually forced all of us to slow down. And the pandemic was a nightmare, right? it, It was funny at the beginning, a lot of people wrote to me when the lockdowns kicked in, they said, you must be so happy, right? The world is finally slow. And I got to say that at no point was I ever happy about the pandemic. It was a total nightmare and an ordeal for everybody in lots of different ways. But I do think that even the worst crises always have silver linings. And I do think that the pandemic gave a lot of us taste of what life would be like without FOMO, for instance, because you couldn't miss out on anything because nothing was happening. It was all (laughs) turned off, right? It also gave us something that we have lost, the art of reflection. This is a society that is so fast that we only ever indulge in reaction. And reflection is so crucial to a life 
well lived. I mean, Socrates talked about the examined life, the importance of taking that time to let the mind wander, to, to sit with yourself, to, to marinate and base yourself in those big questions. That became something that was possible to people because, because the world stopped. <laughs> and it was interesting how many people came out of the pandemic having finally done some of that metaphysical existential homework, having finally got back in touch with themselves through reflection and slowness and time of tranquility and silence and came to big conclusions. So you see a lot of people came out of the pandemic and said, you know what? I was living in autopilot before. I slowed down. I realized that fact. Now I'm going to make some big seismic changes. So many people came out of the pandemic saying, okay, I'm going to change how I work. I'm going to change careers. I'm leaving this bad relationship. I'm going to start a family. I'm going to move from the countryside to the city or the city to, you know, all of these big tectonic shifts that never would have happened without that slowness. And so yeah. it's a reminder to all of us, I think, that that slowness is a superpower. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it it rem when you mentioned the 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 pandemic, it reminded me in the beginning that people said to me, and also Leslie and many other professional organizers, oh, now everybody's got time to clear out their house. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna need a professional organizer anymore because everybody's got time. Because of course, for years everybody used I'm too busy to sort out my house, maybe as an excuse, maybe as a, oh, well, I have so many other things to do. I can't focus on my house. But of course, now nobody could go anywhere and they had the time to clear out their house. And what we saw was almost like a third of people just went decluttering. They were creating piles of stuff in their spare bedroom and in their garage and because they had time to do it all. A third of people were our, our heroes, our crucial people that kept everybody alive, our NHS workers, our, mm. our police, our fire. They didn't have time to do anything because they were the ones keeping the ship afloat. <laughs> exactly, keeping the ship afloat. And then was a third of people who were like, I have the time now, but actually I'm so overwhelmed. I don't even know where to start. I don't know what to do. I don't have the skills. I, I, I'm in a panic. So it was very interesting to see that. And then we as professional organizers thought, you know what? We still have a role here. We still have an important skill that we can share with people. And Leslie and I, at the time, were in the middle of a 40 days, 40 items challenge. So we said to everybody, join us. Let's declutter one item a day. And then the pandemic hit and we were like, oh, wow, this is like the worst time in the world to do a challenge where so much is going on. So we <laughs> asked and said, do you guys want to continue? Because we don't know either what's going to happen. And everybody went, you know what? Please continue because actually making us focus on just one thing a day and do something positive that makes us feel good is actually helping us to deal with all the negative stuff out mm -hmm. there. And the fact that, we see you every day in the Facebook group or how we did it at the time makes us happy because you make us smile and you are so positive and it gives a, a bit of a light bulb moment. And that was actually the, the, the tipping point when we said we have to continue. And with this one item a day, which sounds very slow, but actually for a lot of people, it actually gave them the opportunity to do something that they've never done before. And that was to think and to ponder what's important, like that reflection of mm -hmm. what do I want in my house? What's important to me? How, where do I want to go? What is my aim? So interesting. Yeah. Well, that's, it's hearing you say that. I mean, it reminds me that we're really ultimately although we often use different language, we're on the same team. Right? Yeah. Because what slowing down is, in my conception, is about clearing out the clutter, yeah. moving away from that tsunami of trivial distractions and yeah. overstimulation and yeah. pointless multitasking to focus on what really matters, yeah. to get down to the core of who you are and why you're in this world and how you want to be in it. And that's that. That the only way to get there is to slow down. But another way to think about it is to declutter. Is you're removing, you're paring back, you're taking away the yeah. things that don't matter. And w whenever people talk about my book, in praise of slow, I, I often think it could easily have been called in praise of no, right? Because so much a part of slowing down is is peeling away the stuff that doesn't matter in order to focus on the stuff that does, right? Because as soon as you say no to things that aren't important, what you're actually doing is saying a big yes to the things that are important that really matter. And it reminds me also of a, a famous quote that I always 
I always recall in these circumstances, which came, came from um, Warren Buffett, the legendary American investor who once said, the difference between successful people and very successful people is that very successful people say no to almost everything. <laughs> and, and in a way, I, that is a beautiful distillation, I think, of the slow creed. And also, if you have a imagine a large Venn diagram here, there is a huge overlap with the decluttering work that you do as well, because you're getting to the same place that yeah. I'm trying to steer people as well, which is yeah. to minimize, you know, to get, to take the time to think and reflect on what's important and then let everything else go and give everything you've got to the stuff that really matters. Yeah. On that note, let's take a break. And, oh, I, we have more to discuss because indeed, I think you're so right. We have so many parallels. So listeners, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm talking to Carl Honoré, who is the best-selling author of five books, two TED Talks about in his original book, In Praise of Slow, and why slow is so important in a fast world. Now, I was looking um, at your website, Carl, to prepare for this talk, and I saw this quote on your website that I absolutely love. And you, it said, slow does not mean doing everything at a snail's pace. That would be absurd. It means doing everything at the right speed. Yeah. Wow. That was like a light bulb moment for me. You know, I just like, that is so good. And it's so true that you don't have to kind of sit in an empty house with nothing in your diary to be slow, right? Yeah, exactly. But it's about yeah. finding the balance, isn't it? It is. And and the reason people do default to assuming that slowing down means, as you've just said, sitting in an empty house, having an empty day, is that there is such a deep and abiding taboo against the very idea of slowness in our culture, that slow is a dirty word. It's a, a four-letter word. It's a byword for lazy, stupid boring, unproductive, you know, roadkill, right? And it's it's associated with things that nobody wants to be to be linked with. And I think this taboo means that even when we yearn to slow down, even when we can feel in our bones it would be good for us, that we don't do it because we feel ashamed, we feel guilty, we feel afraid, or we've just simply lost the habit. And I think also that taboo means that when people say, okay, it would be good for you to slow down, we think, oh no, the only way to slow down is to become the Dalai Lama and meditate five hours. No, <laughs> that's not what this is about. It's about understanding that speed comes in all different flavors, right? Sometimes the best thing for the moment is to go fast, right? There, we, we all have a turbo mode and sometimes that's exactly the mode you want to be in, but we also all have a tortoise mode. Sometimes slowness is called for and it's about finding the right. Musicians have a lovely expression for this. They talk about the tempo giusto the correct tempo for each piece of music. And I think that really gets at what this slow revolution is about. It's not about doing everything fast or slow. It's about finding the right speed for the moment. Ultimately, really, if you drill down even deeper, slow is a mindset. It's quality over quantity. It's being present in the moment. It's doing one thing at a time. <laughs> Ultimately, it's about doing everything not as fast as possible, but as well as possible. Mm -hmm. Super simple idea, but one with the power to game change every single thing you do, and it works in the business community as well. The Economist magazine put out a report recently looking at pace in the modern workplace. And, and they came to a conclusion that is actually a perfect summary of this slow philosophy. The final line of that survey from The Economist was something like, mastering the clock of business is about choosing when to be fast, which is a bit we all know, right? But also when to be slow, when to be fast, when to be slow, when to be on, when to be off, when to lean in, we're always being told to lean in, but also when to lean back, right? And it's precisely when you when you crack that code, when you learn how to move up and down the scales of tempo, moving in and out of different speeds and rhythms and paces, that's when the magic happens in everything you do from the bedroom to the boardroom. And look, that's The Economist magazine telling us to slow down. It's not Buddhist Monthly or, or Acupuncture <laughs> Weekly, right? It is the in-house Bible of the most entrepreneurial, ambitious, hard-charging, successful people on the planet. And yeah. The Economist is coming to the same conclusion that we all are, right? which is that in a world addicted to speed, slowness really is a superpower. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a lot of people in our world that 
have a lot of stuff. And Leslie and I always say, you don't have to go from having loads of stuff to nothing. The idea about decluttering and about organizing is not to aim for a minimalist look. Everybody has a different outcome and how they feel happy in their home. And some people still love a very full home that is, you know, abundance and colors and has stuff. But I think what we're the message that we're trying to get, get across is you need to find that quality over that quantity. You need to f- let go of all the surplus items that are clogging up your life because we want you to be able to read that book, to do mm. the arts and crafts that you've bought over the years, but you mm. never have time to do because there's no room in your home to sit down anywhere and do it. We want you to slow down <laughs> and not work so hard in trying to keep your house going because what we know from experience is the more stuff a house has the hard much harder work it is to keep up with it to clean it to to tidy it to find things to put things away if all cupboards are overflowing how can you put your shopping away then things get left out and then it's hard to clean and hoover and everything gets much harder work so you're actually eroding the time that you could spend on relaxation or a walk or doing that puzzle or watching just a bit of telly and hanging on the sofa and not feeling guilty about (laughs) it that you always have to do something yeah so and we see it the same in diaries as well you know when people have less clutter and they start to change their mindset about their stuff what we see is a change in mindset in how do I spend my time? What time do I invest in friends and family? And does that make me happy? Am I happy in my job? I mean, you mentioned it, you know, from the pandemic, but we see that when clutter goes down a little bit, there comes space to think instead of being weighed down all the time about all of the tasks that need to happen in our lives. When there's less clutter, there's more time to think and more time to go, Do I actually enjoy this? Why am I volunteering at six things? Well, I only really enjoy two, but I'm still doing two because I've always done them that way. Mm -hmm. And I think you're so right. I think slow and decluttering overlaps so much. We use different terminology, but what we both aim for is better quality of life, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm just sitting here nodding all the way through because (laughs) everything you're saying echoes my whole worldview with just different language and a, you know slightly different angle and yeah. and filter. I love what you said there also about how every person will find their own landing strip that it, some people will want to be a bit more minimalist, a bit more. St- and that's very much like slow that what's everybody has their own personal internal metronome, right? So what's fast for me might be slow for you. What's yeah. oh, perfect for you might be a little bit too fast for me, you know? And so it's really not about, keeping up with the Joneses or downloading a schedule from Amazon that's going to suit every, because there isn't, there's no universal formula. It's about finding that time and space, which you do through slowing down and decluttering and all those things that we do and offer to people together to create that. Well, Virginia Woolf had that lovely expression, the great cathedral space of childhood. And I think of it as that huge space that we have just to let the mind wander, to contemplate the big picture, to look to the the horizon. And that's when we start coming to sensible decisions about how we want to live our lives in the here and now. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I loved also what you said there about the um, the one item a day challenge, not making it something that you've got to, because this is something you often find with slowing down. People say, oh man, I saw your TED talk or I read your book and I thought I need to slow down. So I signed up for yoga. I ran across the street to do some meditation. I hurried home to cook a four course slow food meal. <laughs> you think, well, wait a minute. That's you're kind of not getting the point here <laughs> because really you have to slow down slowly. And I think it's a, all these changes are a process. And so I love that idea of one item per day, because not only does that avoid the sense of being overwhelmed and the mistakes we make when we try and do everything at once, yeah, but it also turns it into a process or a journey yeah. rather than obsessing about hitting the destination. And yeah. so much of 
the wisdom and the learning and the joy and the magic comes from the journey itself, right? The mm -hmm. process itself each day, if it's just picking one item in your house, that can seem on the outside like something not that important, but actually it can trigger a whole avalanche of deeper thinking and, and yeah. new thoughts and, and new ways of being. Yeah, because you you just mentioned it's the journey, not the destination, and you actually wrote a book about that, a children's <laughs> book, haven't you? It's I haven't right. I haven't read it. I have read slow, and I've read I've read um, under pressure. Um, I haven't read the kids' book. So, is it what's your message in the? So your message in the book is like you need to look along the way and not only focus on where you're going. Is that is that yeah. the message for I kids? I mean, there's so much. You know, the old expression: the things that we lose when we when we don't stop and stare. And so it's a book about stopping and staring and and moving through the world with your eyes open, with your five senses lit up, uh, being present, uh, and and just thrilling to this extraordinary smorgasbord of experience that the world offers up to us, but but that we tend to rush through. And once we slow down and do one thing at a time and take our, our time and, and really deliver ourselves fully to the moment, then then the world lights up in, mm -hmm. in every possible shade. And that's it's a children's book. It's my first children's book, which was a real joy to write, actually. I wrote it during the pandemic. So at a time when I couldn't travel myself, I was able to travel in my mind on a mm -hmm. magic carpet of words and images and it's it's just a a way for for me to share the idea of slow through travel because it's some obviously I do a lot of talking about slow and I do a lot of traveling so it's a nice way to bring the two together and I think aiming it at children also makes good sense because the earlier we start grappling with these ideas of time and pace and slowness and speed the better we're off we're going to be right yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to wait till you're 39 hovering on the brink of your first breakdown to start thinking about slowing down, right? Yeah, we, yeah. we need to start instilling this this wisdom about the power of slowness as young as possible and starting yeah. in school. So I, I thought, why why not put up, put it out there in the form of a children's book? Yeah. <laughs> it just reminded me that's an, it's so funny that you said it because it's another parallel of what we what we see in our membership with our members that have younger children. They're like, wow, um, I'm, I'm getting my kids on board, you know, with with some of the daily chores. And one of us, one of them, sent us a lovely picture of her. I think her, her five year old son now helping with the recycling, you know, bringing it, <laughs> putting it in the bins. <laughs> but it's you, you teach them young. You teach them the habits of put your plate in the dishwasher, help mommy set the table, um, put your laundry in the laundry basket and not on the floor. Instead of kind of waiting until they're fourteen, going. Why is your bedroom always such a tip? And why didn't you never tidy it up? It's like, well, you've never taught me how to do it. You've just always said tidy up your room, but I don't know what that means. Yeah. So you have to start young with those habits as well, those good habits of being part. And I always, I always kind of say to my kids, this is not a hotel. We all have to, you know, mm -hmm. we all have to do something here. This is not a hotel where you can just leave everything and think that somebody else will tidy it up. And I mean, even our my hotel room would be tidy, but that's beside the point. I'm sure it I, would be. <laughs> I, I want to make a point. And it was so funny. I once traveled with, traveled with my friend um, Juliet to a conference. And she's a professional organizer as well. And she said, you could see a clear line in the room. What was Ingrid's side and what was my side? Ingrid's side was all nice and neat. And my <laughs> side had stuff everywhere. She said, we're all different organizers as well. Not all of us are intrinsically tidy and decluttered. And it's a skill you can learn. And I so agree with you. You know, we we run through life at at such a speed that we have to, we don't want to completely break down before we realize that we've gone much too fast for far too long. Yeah. And you do often find that people wake up sometime, often in their 30s or 40s, and just think, whoa, and then look back and think, that was my last 15 years. I mean, that's just, nothing has stuck. Yeah. It passed in a blur. How did I get here? Did I really yeah. decide to this path? Is this the route that I wanted? <laughs> and yeah. really it's because people haven't taken the time earlier on to pause and also sometimes to sit with discomfort. I think this is another thing and another reason why we run away from slowness is that slowness can be uncomfortable, right? It can, it can cause to bubble up difficult, gnarled, frightening questions 
But those are the questions that you have to contend with if you're going to come up with useful answers or, or better questions that will help steer you towards a life worthy of the name. Mm. The, the, the worst thing I think we can do, and many of us do it, and I certainly was doing it for a while, was just to push those questions aside, put them in a box somewhere and put your head down and go full speed ahead. Yeah. Because that- Knuckle down. Knuckle down, get through. But what is that really isn't what life is. I mean, at some point you're going to wake up or crash into a brick wall and think, whoa, I just sacrificed how many years on the altar of what? Right. Yeah. Of, of what really? <laughs> of yeah. speed, of busyness, of prestige, of a pension pot, of pleasing my parents, of what all those things that kind of go into the mix that drive us down avenues that aren't really made for us, right? We find ourselves following other people's scripts when mm -hmm. we don't take the time to write our own script. Yeah. And to figure out, I think, for ourselves what is important to us and yeah. um what makes us happy. You know, when you when you're on a hamster wheel, it's so easy to just keep going all the time and not step off. And I think, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, it's it's absolutely fascinating. I think when people take more time, they actually have all these things that I suddenly realized that they've lost out on sometimes. And you can use that as a thing to make you depressed, but it can also, you can also use it as a positive and go, well, actually I've realized this now. I don't want this anymore. How do I move forward? Yeah. I think you can, you can use it as fuel yeah. to fire yourself into the remaining chapters of your life with yeah. a completely different spirit. One that says, yeah. I'm going to take the time to work out who I am, what I want and 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 how I can make a life that that reflects and honors that. And yeah. rather than feeling, okay, I've squandered however many years, that that's just going to bum you out and lead you down a not very happy rabbit hole. Far better to to take that and parlay it into something into something hopeful. Mm. Yeah, and I think sure. many, many people could do that. I especially actually my, my most recent work actually, my most recent book is adult book is called Boulder, and it's about aging and reframing aging and thinking about how to to make later life sing and one of the things we do tend to gain in, in in the second half of our lives is that perspective people do start to say whoa what am i doing here what kind of life do i want to live and and often that happens around the age of 40 across all cultures and socioeconomic groups people begin to wake up and think okay i've been on autopilot i need to pause rethink reboot change direction pivot whatever the phrase is you you want to hang your hat on but I always feel, why wait till you're 43 to do that? Yeah. <laughs> why not have why not have those conversations with yourself in your teens, right? Yeah. Even or even younger, and start always at every stage of life, be asking yourself, you know, am I living a life that really is right for me? You know, yeah, a tough yeah. question, a scary one, because you may not be, yeah. and then you have to make difficult decisions. So it's easy to and and to see why people think, well, I don't want to deal with that question because it's going to open a door to some pretty unnerving stuff yeah much better just to leave it in the cupboard yeah uh, but actually that's a very short term as way of thinking isn't it yeah 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 it's 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 um what that's what we see a lot as well it's like oh i just i've got all this stuff now in my house and i wish i didn't at the time buy it and it's like but but it, it is what it is now and now you've got the moment to go okay how do i want to move forward and then it's like well I want to be better for my house, for myself, for my family, for the environment. And it's like, but you can do that just because you've always done it in a certain way. doesn't, you know, it's good to reflect sometimes and think, where did all this culture come from? Where did all this time, you know, I've wasted so much time. It's like, okay, but you can't change the past. You are where you are now. So how are you moving forward? however long you've got left and nobody knows the answer to that question. Um, but how can you enjoy the rest in your way? And yeah, I think that's, that's, that's maybe yeah. the crux of it, isn't it? I think, it, I think it is. And it's important not to be on a soapbox and haranguing people and making them feel bad about because this is the world we live in now and yeah. we are human beings and we're flawed. And this, these are the, yeah, yeah. the, the ways that we tend to, to conduct ourselves, but 
I think the takeaway here for all of us is that whatever age you are, whatever stage of life you're at, you can still stop, you can still pause, you can still slow down, you can still declutter, you can do all those things that will allow you to make sure that the next chapters of your life are luminous, right? Yeah. Wherever you are on life's great arc, the rest of your life can be the best of your life. Yeah. It can only be that if you do that slow decluttering homework up front. That's the starting point. That's the launch pad. And it's there for all of us, right? Because let's be honest, for most of us, it's free, right? You don't have to buy anything for the most (laughs) part to declutter. In fact, the opposite, right? Or to slow down. Yeah. Often it means spending less in the, in, in, in certainly in the longer term. So final question for you then, Carl, what do you do to slow down? (laughs) What do you enjoy while slowing down is maybe a better question. As you expect, I have lots of slow arrows in my like quiver. Uh, I'm I'm a huge cook. I love cooking. And for me, cooking is just like yoga. I, I just, I just, all of the sort of fast stuff just melts away as soon as the onion or the garlic hits the, starts sizzling in the pan. I just, I love cooking and I love cooking and eating with, with people that who matter to me. I, I, I do do yoga. I do a bit of meditation. I love being in nature. I think walking, especially in a, a green space is an immensely powerful way to slow down, whether you call it ecotherapy or forest bathing, you know, mother nature is there for all of us. So, so go out there. And I also love to read. I, I don't read on a screen. I love novels. And so a big part every day, I will be reading some novel of some kind at some stage. Okay. No speed reading involved. <laughs> <laughs> reading every word. <laughs> no multiple page turn technique. <laughs> Thank you so much for this conversation, Carl. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, if people want to find out more about you, I mean, of course, we're going to put all the show notes and the links to the TED Talks and, and, and everything in the show notes. But if people want to have one place where they can find out everything from you, where do they go? That's very easy. It's just... Carl Honore, my full name, no punctuation, carlhonore.info. And there you'll find links to everything, audio, video, you name it, much more than anyone would ever want to know about me and my work in one place. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much for for being a guest. And listeners, have you had maybe a moment of going, yes, I'm going much too fast. I need to go slow. Let us know, share with us. You know that Leslie and I love receiving your comments, your um, your emails. Let us know on declutterhub.com forward slash 261 how you feel about slowing down or maybe realizing that you're going too fast. Thank you for this conversation again, Carl. It was an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you. It's been a joy from start to finish. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to the Declutter Hub podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to us in your podcast player so you don't miss an episode and we'll see you next week.